Please take a minute now to listen to my good friend, Carl Carlson, a man that I have great respect for. I've worked in ministries with him since 1986. I want you to hear his heart, and maybe you can understand why some of the people that are homeless on the streets might not be exactly there because of why you think they're there. Uh, my name is Carl Carlson. Uh, to be real forthright with you, I'm doing this because of my good friend and brother, Louis Johnston, who I have immense amount of respect for and love. In the name of Jesus Christ. I guess Louis and I go back a long ways, 1985, 86, 87, something like that. I first met him at First Church of the Nazarene, Fifth and Woodland. He supported a ministry the Lord had given me called YCAP. I grew up with nothing. Never knew my mother and father. They ran off on me, abandoned me, left me at the doorstep. I'm told when I was four or five years old in an orphanage in Portland, Oregon. From there, I was raised in orphanages, foster homes, later state reformatories. I started doing time when I was 10 years old just for running away from home. Home, hmm. The way they would punish us in that reform school was they take you in a room about the size probably of your living room with seven, eight grown men bigger than me and they'd lay you on a bunk with a steel bar across it. And they'd say, boy, grab that bar. And they'd bring out a razor strap. Actually, the real name of it is razor strop, which you see in the old barber shops. You don't see those too often anymore. And they had attached a wooden handle to it. And depending on your offense, uh, they'd begin to lay it on you. Now, it's obvious why they'd have seven, eight grown men in there in case you bucked. I stayed there a year, year and a half, got out. I was back again a year later. This time I actually committed a crime. I stole something. I stole some cartons of cigarettes out of a grocery store. Went back for another year and a half. Got out, I guess I'm about 15 by then, 16. No guidance, no direction, no nothing, no love. My heart began to fill with hate, despair, frustration, anger. My brother Philip and I stole a car in Wachula, Florida. We took it across the state line, ended up in South Carolina where we wrecked the car running from the police. I went to a federal prison for young men. I was 16 years old. I was sentenced to what's called a, at the time a zip six, six months to six years. I guess I did about three years there. The way they would punish you there, they'd take you into a room about the size of your bathroom and strip you buck naked. And again, depending on your offense, would depend on how long you stayed in that room one meal a day. They couldn't get away with all that today, but that's the way it was then. I'll be 68 in a couple of months, so this is a long time ago. Got out, went to work in a steel mill in Florida, Florida Steel, located in Tampa, Florida. I wonder if it's still there. Like a couple of million other guys, I was drafted into the Army, uh, Vietnam. You know, what's interesting about that, I had tried to enlist and they wouldn't take me. And then the body bags started coming back pretty heavily and I was drafted. Went to Vietnam. Discovered drugs. But despite that, I can honestly look any man in the eye and, and say I served my country honorably. I'm not going to get into any war stories. Came home. Went through the drill sergeant academy, became the youngest drill sergeant in my battalion. I was 20, 22, 23. Mustered out in early 73. Couldn't find a job. 
I'd go to construction site after construction site after construction site looking for work. No work, no work. I didn't know the term then, but the war was winding down and we were in the middle of what I guess would call a recession. Eventually I went to work in a nightclub, uh, bartending. Crazy, just pure crazy. Dope, booze, women, that crazy lifestyle. Ended up committing a couple of armed robberies, went to prison on a 15-year prison sentence here in the state of Tennessee. That's what's known as the walls. This prison's been closed for 20, 25 years. It's where they make movies now. The Green Mile, The Last Castle, that's where I did my time. I believe the prison was built for six, maybe 800 men. When I was there, there was 2,000 men there. My brother came out there to see me one time, one time only, and started telling me about this Jesus. I didn't have a clue about him, nothing. I'll never forget what I said to him. I said, Philip, you see them walls, you see them gun tires, there ain't no God out there. And I proceeded to explain to him what was back there. But what he did is he planted a seed and later, through a series of circumstances, God brought me totally to my knees and I cried out to this God whom I did not know. And I'm here to tell you right now, folks, he touched me, man. And I ain't never been the same. Now, I didn't know what the word covenant meant at the time, but I knew about a deal. And I made a deal with God that if he gave me a godly woman, that I would do the best I knew how to serve him the rest of my life. He walked me out of that prison six, eight months later. Went on to Trevecca Nazarene College where I met my bride-to-be, Karen. That's 35 years ago. A wonderful, wonderful Christian woman who took a great risk in marrying me. You can imagine her friends and her, some of her family saying, are you out of your mind? You're gonna marry this ex-convict. Well, she did. Very, very small wedding. We didn't have nothing. But God has blessed me. The faithfulness of God. I love that old gospel hymn, How Great Is Thy Faithfulness. He allowed me to start a ministry called YCAP, where we work with inner city, call them what you will, juvenile offenders, throwaway kids, basically, like I was. All of us, you and I, are all products of our life's experiences. And he used that terrible childhood and all that abuse and pain and despair to start that ministry. Started with just Karen and I, nothing. No money, no board, no church, no nothing. When I left there, we had about 17, 18 on staff. We had, uh, had a group home for runaway boys. Uh, Brother Millard Reed, with a handshake, gave me that home and we renovated it. We were working when I left there. I, I'll be real candid with you. I'm not actually sure. Two or 300 kids had 17 on staff. I don't have any volunteers, literally hundreds. But I was physically, emotionally, and most of all, spiritually burnt toast when I left YCAP. I would go to the park and I'd take the word of God and a lot of water and coffee and I would sit at the lake and I would pray and read the Bible and cry and meditate and pray and ask this God, what do you want from me? I had given it at all. I don't know if you've ever given everything you have to a cause greater than yourself that is, that is of what you believe is of God, but I had done that. I was through with ministry. But God in his incredible mercy and love and deep compassion restored me. I didn't know it, but he was preparing me to start another ministry that we call Men of Valor. Again, it started with just caring of myself. No board, no church, no nothing. <laughs> but God Almighty and this zeal to help men in prison. I hate prisons. And I realize that there's a need. I believe strongly in the rule of law. But I also believe even stronger in the Bible, the Holy Scripture. And Jesus was clear there on a mandate if we're trying to follow him. So we started this ministry in discipling men. 
It has grown beyond anybody's imagination or expectation, most of all mine. Now we're at 18, what is it, 19 on staff. We have what we call an aftercare program where we provide transitional housing, jobs, uh, Lord knows what else, when the men successfully complete our program in the prison. We started the family children's aspect of the ministry six, seven years ago, where we now have four staff and their total focus is on these families and in particular, these children. I do not re need research to substantiate this, but it does. 70% of these children of an incarcerated father will end up in prison unless effective and I believe godly intervention occurs in their lives. So we're working very hard to stem that tide right here in Nashville, Tennessee. We're embarking upon a huge endeavor to build our own Menabala campus, where we're gonna give men, women, and children an opportunity at a decent life. And long after I'm gone, if the Lord blesses us, which I believe he will, long after I'm gone, it's gonna impact hundreds and down the road, thousands of men, women, and children for the kingdom of God. And let me be clear on this. This is in spite of me, in spite of me. The faithfulness of God, He's given me four sons, two in the United States Marine Corps, and two older sons who are doing very well, all by the grace of God and a praying, faithful mother. I thank God for Louis Johnston and his ministry, layman lessons, feeding hundreds and thousands of desperate people. And I don't know who's watching this show, but I've known this man many years, and I believe in this man, and I believe deeply in his ministry. And I would pray and hope you would support his ministry because it is of God Almighty. And he's not just feeding them. He's bringing them the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's bringing light into their lives. He's giving them hope. That's really what Men of Valor is about. That's really what Layman Lessons is about when you get right down to where the rubber meets the road. It's about hope, hope. We live in the greatest, I still believe, the greatest country in the world where an old throwaway kid like me can achieve what I've achieved by the grace, mercy, and love of God Almighty, but also living in the greatest country in the world that provides those opportunities if you're willing to work hard, if you're willing to accept responsibility, if you're willing to sacrifice. I don't know what else to say. That's all I got to say. I do cover your prayers for this little ministry we call Men of Valor. God bless you, Louie, and your work. And God bless whoever's watching this thing. Thank you.